My name is Anamina Reeder. I'm a researcher and lecturer at the University of St. Gallen. In today's video, we're going to look into the scientific foundations of nudging. After watching this video, you should be able to answer the following questions. What are the basic principles of behavioral economics and the two modes of thinking in humans? What are the underlying principles and mechanics of nudging? And what are typical nudges and what psychological effects do they use? Let's start with some principles of behavioral economics. Around half a century ago, behavioral economists set out to challenge classical economic theory and portray economic behavior in a more realistic way. Introducing concepts from cognitive psychology, they contrasted the, the established concept of the homo economicus with more realistic models and theories. Some of you may remember this from introductory econ class. Classical economic theory presumes humans to make rational decisions at all times. Moreover, we find such key assumptions as stable preferences, the ability to weigh each and every alternative given a decision problem, and the consideration of all available information. Last, based on the principle of utility maximization, classical economics expects people to make self-serving decisions. Now, hands down, when we compare a real-life behavior with these assumptions, we find that in many cases, our decisions are not quite this rational. By introducing concepts such as bounded rationality or a limited willpower, behavioral economists aim to explain human behavior in a more realistic way and concede irrationality and systematic errors to human decision makers. Key assumptions or preferences are unstable and depending on the context and the situation. You may have noticed that you will end up with different stuff in your shopping cart depending on whether you were hungry when you went grocery shopping or not. Then decisions we make are often ad hoc and based on our intuition. We like to use rules of thumb or mental shortcuts to come to a decision. Also, we usually rely on the information that is easily available and accessible. Last, sometimes our decisions are not self-serving. For example, when we act out of fairness or altruism. Despite being irrational at times, human decision-making is far from unpredictable. Research suggests the existence of two different cognitive systems or modes of thinking. System one, the autopilot or the automatic mode of thinking, operates automatically, quickly, effortlessly, and without voluntary control. System two, on the other hand, the pilot, or the reflective mode of thinking works fully consciously, is slower and requires effort and volition. Typically, system one is in charge of unconscious everyday actions and decisions and utilizes heuristics that are simple rules of thumb or mental shortcuts to arrive at decisions quickly and effortlessly. Generally, this works quite well, but sometimes using such heuristics and shortcuts will generate systematic errors or so-called cognitive biases. So if system one is overcharged with a decision, system two takes over or we may deliberately activate it. System two is reliable in solving complex decision problems, but it is also quite fatiguing for us to use it. Based on this rational, you may be tempted to think, well, if I have this reliable system too, why should I be using that faulty system one in the first place? Well, imagine driving a car and consciously having to think about each and every activity, turning the keys, hitting the gas, shifting the gears, stopping at the red light, driving on when it turns green. In just a few minutes of our day-to-day -day lives, we make a large number of tiny decisions, which if we had to reflect on each and every of them, will leave us exhausted and depleted pretty quickly. In fact, our system too is lazy and its capacity is easily exhausted. So it makes total sense to leave these day-to-day -day activities to system one, at which it performs very efficiently and most of the time perfectly. Thereby, we can free up our cognitive capacity for the complex decisions for which we really want to rely on system two rather than system one. So decisions we make are the product of an efficient division of labor between our two mental systems. And in principle, this process yields fair results. 
This division of labor provides grounds to understand why our decisions are efficient, yet not always rational and perfect. For example, we have difficulties evaluating alternatives. When we're presented with two options, we are usually able to compare them across multiple attributes and dimensions, but as soon as there are three or even more options, we're overloaded. So we start breaking the complex decision problem down to a few dimensions that facilitate the evaluation. I guess we've all been in this situation. Late afternoon, hungry, or just bored, craving a little something, and even though we know that the apple should be the go-to option, the muffin is so incredibly tempting. Grabbing the muffin suggests that our limited willpower lets us give in to temptations. Also, it is a very human thing to go for the short-term gratification rather than seeking the long-term positive effects of a balanced diet, for example. Next, and this is what sets us apart from Commander Spock, our behaviors are influenced by our emotions. Sometimes we may base our decisions on such factors as fairness, but also negative emotions like frustration or anger shouldn't be underestimated when it comes to influencing our decisions. Last, we're social beings and our embeddedness in a society, of course, has an impact on our decisions. Just like animals, we tend to copy others' behaviors to fit in. Now let's have a look at how nudges make use of this knowledge. The concept of nudging has been around for some decades now, but public awareness was only raised in 2008 when Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein published their best-selling book, Nudge. Richard Thaler, who received a Nobel Prize back in 2017, is viewed as the father of nudges for pioneering the research in this field. But what are nudges? Translating into gentle poke or push, they are exact that. Nudges are elements that use or counteract heuristics and biases to influence human behavior in a predefined way. Preserving free choice makes them gentle pokes rather than a coercive push. So eliminating options or making them extremely unattractive, like imposing disproportionate effort or sanctions does not fall under the scope of nudging. Nice, but how can this be done? You may be asking yourself. The key word here is choice architecture. An architect shapes an environment with the architecture of his building, for example, a staircase, and thereby influences how we will behave in this environment. This architecture makes it more likely that we will take the stairs to get to the entrance of the building than climbing the side of the staircase. The same happens when we nudge. We shape a decision environment by giving it a very specific choice architecture that is meant to influence behavior in a predetermined way. Such a decision environment may be the man's room. By putting a sticker of a fly into the urinal, the choice architecture at Amsterdam Schiphol Airport was changed in such a way that would focus users' attention toward aiming for the fly. The effect? Soiling was reduced by 80%. Another example is from Copenhagen in Denmark. In an experiment, researchers distributed candy wrapped in plastic to pedestrians. In one area, they had set up bright green garbage cans and footprints on the sidewalk that led the way to the garbage cans. Another area was left unchanged. Regular garbage cans, no footprints. After giving out the candy, they measured the amount of wrapping ending up on the floor. In the area with the green cans and the footprints, that was around half of what was measured in the other unchanged area. Let's look at the psychological effects that shape our behaviors and that can serve as a basis for nudges. The academic literature and psychological effects is endless. If we narrow it down to those effects that have been used or suggested with respect to nudging, our selection will count 20 effects. In this video, I will focus on the five most prominent psychological effects used in nudging. The first psychological effect we're going to look at is framing. Researchers have shown that the way a decision problem is presented will influence our decisions. When we learn that a medical treatment will be successful in 50% of the cases, we're more likely to seek the treatment than if it is communicated to be unsuccessful in 50% of cases although the message content is exactly the same. Similarly, emphasizing certain attributes of an option will influence our decisions. 
In online commerce, we often see the framing effect utilized when a product is presented in light of complementary products. In this example, when browsing through the photos of this t-shirt on Zalando, we're suggested to complete the look. The t-shirt is framed by other pieces of clothing to represent a complete look and provide inspiration for our next purchase. And our well-known psychological effect is the status quo bias. According to the status quo bias, we have a strong preference for remaining in the current state over changing. It is, for example, manifested in people's reluctance to change their cell phone contract or health insurance contract, even though alternatives may be more attractive. In our minds, change is associated with uncertainty and unpredictable risks. So we perceive the departure from the status quo as a loss, despite the potential disadvantages of remaining in the status quo. This effect is stronger the longer the state has persisted. Many organizations use double-sided printing as a default setting to save paper and thereby exploit the status quo bias. Users tend to follow the default rather than manually changing the settings. Social norms refer to common rules and standards that steer the beliefs and behaviors of social groups. Individuals imitate the behaviors of others to obtain approval, avoid being isolated, and minimize the risk of sanctions. So these shared behavioral patterns spread across larger groups without central organization because we observe others' behaviors and anticipate their approval or disapproval. The people considered for reference may differ depending on the context. They can range from our closest friends to unknown other users or experts and even celebrities and influencers. In this example, Spotify is trying to harness social norm effects in their recommendation feature. By showing us suggestions based on what fans of a particular artist also like, they make us feel like part of a social group so that we follow the behavior that is portrayed as the standard behavior of this group. Loss aversion is another psychological effect that is used abundantly in online commerce and on booking websites. According to loss aversion, individual weigh losses and disadvantages more heavily than equivalent gains and benefits. Therefore, we tend to avoid risks, even if they hold greater potential for gains. When we're facing a situation of scarcity, whether real or not, this activates our fear of loss and we tend to act more quickly. This process is harnessed when booking websites indicate that there is only a few rooms left or a few articles in stock and thereby signal scarcity. Last, when assessing choice options, we rely on reference values or anchors that may or may not be related to the decision. Based on this, the result of the assessment will be skewed towards the anchor. That's why very often when assessing the value of a product or service, our assessment is based on the price of similar products and not based on the attributes of the product in question. The same is done in the example in which two anchors are set, which give us the impression that getting print and digital both at the rate of the individual offer is indeed the best value, no matter our needs. So as you can see, there is quite a lot we can do to exploit the imperfections in our decision making. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested in this topic and want to know more about it, I've linked for the readings and references in the description below. Thanks for watching.